Welcome. This is a class on pastoral counseling here at the Master's Seminary. In fact, this may be a somewhat unusual class for you to take because it, here at the Master's Seminary, we're not just dedicated to the inerrancy and sufficiency or the inerrancy and inspiration of the Word of God. We're also very committed to its sufficiency as well. My name is John Street, and I teach the pastoral counseling classes here at the seminary. And it's a joy to have you to be a part of our class. And in this first segment, we want to spend some time talking about what true uh, pastoral counseling is about. Uh, how do we define it? What is it specifically? And that's a critical thing to do because there are an awful lot of people who claim to do pastoral counseling. And there are a lot of people who claim to do biblical counseling when in reality, they're not doing biblical counseling at all. Um, and in fact, we have a lot of people in the world who claim to be Christians and to do Christian kind of counseling, or there are people who claim to be Christian psychologists as well. And there are an awful lot of seminaries around the world that teach pastoral counseling classes. But I think that you're going to find out that this particular class on pastoral counseling is unique. In other words, it stands out different from all the others because we are very committed to the sufficiency of the word of God in dealing with the true soul problems that people encounter. And so we are going to go through, in a sense, an adventure together, studying the word of God and learning what true biblical counseling is and how you training to be a pastor or training to be a lay man or woman in a church can use the scriptures in order to counsel other people with serious soul problems of life. We're talking about problems that like depression or people who have uh, different types of fears that the world often refers to with the Greek term phobias, um, or maybe people who are even schizophrenic or manifest symptoms of schizophrenic, um, phrenia, um, or possibly even people who uh, struggle with uh, bipolar disorders. Um, how do you deal with people like that? And does the Bible have the sufficiency to be able to address those kinds of issues? Um, and I think that you're going to find out throughout our course that the Bible is incredibly rich and it's very robust when it comes to addressing those issues. Now, really, what is biblical counseling? Um, I can remember uh, back uh, several years ago, uh, sitting among a group of Christian psychologists at another seminary, and at that particular time, they were describing to me how they use the Bible in their counseling, and they wanted to be referred to as uh, being biblical counselors. And as I carefully listened to everything that they had to say, it became very obvious that not only um, uh, did they want to be known in a sense as biblical counselors, but, um, uh, they wanted me to accept the fact that they were biblical counselors. And, and it became clear to me that really what they were doing in their counseling is that they were appealing to the Bible occasionally in their counseling. Oftentimes they even included prayer. Sometimes they didn't in their counsel. And as a result of that, they believed that their counsel was biblical. Well, one of the things that I, I said to them, well, an awful lot of people use the Bible, cults use the Bible, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're biblical in, in, in their ministry. And in a similar way, that's what a Christian psychology attempts to do. It attempts to co-op the authority of the word of God and sort of add the word of God to pre-existing secular theories rather than allowing the very structure and framework of theology to set up their counseling system. We want, we want to be different here at Master Seminary. We want... Um, not just for the sake of difference, but because of our belief and commitment to the word of God as it has been given to us. Now, when I went to seminary, I was the type of a person who went to seminary for the purpose of learning how to preach. That's what I wanted to do. Um, 
And in fact, I wasn't interested in counseling at all, even though my background in undergraduate was a considerable amount of psychology. I really wasn't interested in that. I really wanted to stand in a pulpit and deliver sermons. Now, learning how to preach is vitally important. It's critical. It's critical here at the Master Seminary. Uh, it is one of the utmost uh, important ventures for a pastor to do. But that is only part of the story. If all you do is want to stand behind a pulpit and deliver sermons, then don't call yourself a pastor because you're not a pastor. Um, a pastor is a person who's willing to work with individual people. Sermons are a monologue. In other words, they are one person delivering the word of God, which is vital and important and necessary for the church of Jesus Christ. But counseling is a dialogue. It's where you have a counselee or counselees, plural, and you are dialoguing with them and with the word of God. In reality, counseling is a form of discipleship. Uh, discipleship, in this sense, is a broader definition because discipleship is usually what we do, especially to people that are new or new converts to the faith, where we teach them the basic fundamentals of the faith. But in that process, you begin to realize that people have serious problems. They have marital issues. They have parenting problems. Or they have emotional issues that they're attempting to deal with or a conflict with another person. And as you're going through that discipleship, you realize that people are very complex people. They're not just uh, receptacles that you dump biblical information into. They also have a life and they have a context of a life in which you have to address that context where they're coming from, the difficulties and the problems that they face in that life. This pastoral counseling class is intended to help you learn how to address that. I've heard a lot of count, uh, pastors say, I don't do counseling. Well, if that's the case, then it's obvious that you don't want to be like your Savior because in Isaiah 9, 6, it's very clear he is referred to as the wonderful counselor. And a true pastor um, is a counselor. In fact, he is not just a counselor. He's to train the people in his congregation on how to counsel. When I served in pastoral ministry for 25 years, almost all of my counseling, I had somebody in our congregation, usually a leader, sitting there watching and observing my counseling. So I was training them at the same time while counseling someone else. Now, in order to help us to understand that, let me talk with you a little bit about what counseling is not, and then I want to talk about what it is. And in order to get you into that, let me share with you a story. I mentioned to you that when I went to seminary, I wanted to be a preacher. I wanted to preach the word of God. And the seminary that I attended at that particular time did teach me how to preach and did a good job of teaching how to do good exegesis. But it did a very, very poor job of teaching me how to be a pastoral counselor. In fact, I was content with that because I was more than willing to let somebody else do counseling. If I had people in my church who had real serious problems, I would sh ship it off to a neighborhood psychologist until I became very, very convicted about the pastor's role, uh, not just as a counselor, but as a trainer of, the, of uh, his congregation and how to do counseling. And, um, and in fact, the first church that I was a pastor as an associate, the senior pastor required everybody to get biblical counseling training. And I had just spent four years in college and four years in seminary. One of the last things I wanted to do was go back into a classroom. So I had a very bad attitude about doing it. Um, uh, and what made matters worse was this was about a three and a half hour drive away from where we were at. And it was a class that started at nine o'clock in the morning and ended around nine or 10 o'clock at night. And then I would have to drive home late at night. And this went on for about 12 weeks, every Monday for 12 weeks. And I can remember driving to that first class, grumbling, complaining, sinning all over the freeway and arrived at the class at nine o'clock and sat down in the back with my Bible and notebook and decided that I'd be kind of a, a, a reluctant learner. And we went through the class that day and there was a lot of information that was shared. Uh, but later on that evening, I was asked to sit in on a counseling 
uh, case that one of the teachers in the class, uh, a man by the d- name of Dr. Bill Good, had at that time. And there was another uh, young pastor who was asked to sit in and observe that counseling as well. And um, Bill told us ahead of time, at that time, Bill, uh, I didn't know Bill hardly at all, but later on, he became a very good friend. Uh, Bill told us at that particular time, I don't know who is coming in. I've never met these people. They've driven from out of state to come to our church for counseling. They have a serious problem. I'm, I'm not even sure what it is. And so we had prayer, and then this couple arrived, and they came into the counseling uh, room, which was Bill's office at the time. And I could tell they were an elderly couple around 75 years of age. And um, he was well dressed with a three piece suit on at that particular time. And she had a beautiful dress on. And they sat down across from Bill. And uh, one of the things I observed about them was that they didn't look any of us in the eye. They sort of, shame was written all over their countenance. And um, Bill had prayer with them. And then after the prayer, he looked at them and he said to them, "Um, why have you come for counseling? Uh, What brings you here? And they kind of stuttered a little bit, um, didn't know what to say. And Bill said, listen, I know that you've driven from out of state to come here, so you might as well share why you've come. And then the man began to share a story on how he uh, lived in in a town where Uh, He owned a company. He had about 500 people who worked for him in that company. And um, he had also been the chairman of the board of his church for at least two or three decades. And he had been arrested in a public park for flashing people. Now, maybe it was me being raised in a small town myself I was kind of surprised and shocked to hear that I had never met anyone who had ever done that before. And I kind of sat back in my chair thinking to myself, um, wow, this should be really interesting. I want to see how he handles this one. And then I began to think to myself, especially having completed seminary, all right, John, if this guy was sitting across from you, how would you deal with this particular problem? And really, I didn't have a clue. Uh, I I didn't know how I would deal with that particular problem. Um, I thought about different passages in Scripture that possibly might address that problem. I thought about David when, on one occasion, if you remember, he danced naked before God, but I didn't think that that was going to help the problem at all. In fact, that was going to make things even worse. And I even got so desperate that I went actually took my Bible and went to the concordance of my Bible and began to look for the word flashing. Now, I knew it wasn't there, but just in case I had missed it, I wanted to make sure. And obviously, the Bible didn't address that issue, at least not with that terminology. And I saw Bill open the scriptures and begin to address that man's heart and the issues and the motivations that will fuel that kind of thinking and that kind of behavior. And at the same time, I saw Bill address that wife who she and her husband at one particular point had been the the pinnacle of respect in their community, in their family, in their church. And when this appeared on the front page of their local newspaper, they had gone from respect to being rejected by almost everyone except for very close family members. So he had drug his personal testimony through the mud, his uh, company and his company's name through the mud, as well as his church through the mud, by um, by this very grievesome and sinful activity. But I saw Bill so masterfully use the scriptures to address that man's heart. And I realized at that particular time that I had learned in seminary how to dispense the Bible, but I had not learned how to minister the Bible. There's a big difference between those two things. Uh, There are a lot of people who know how to dispense biblical truth, but they don't know how to minister the word of God to people who are really hurting. This is what this pastoral counseling class is all about. And I hope it's going to be of help to you because um, it it brought about a radical transformation in my life.
I can remember that very night driving home three and a half hours. My wife was already in bed. She was half asleep. And I remember walking into the room where she was at and kneeling next to the bed and literally in tears saying to her, uh, sweetheart, I'm a lousy husband. I'm a lousy father and I'm a lousy pastor. Will you ever forgive me? And I remember her looking at me and she squinting her eyes and she kind of rubbed her eyes and she said, I don't know what this class is doing, but I really like it. <laughs> so she knew that already this class was beginning to make a transformation in my life. And on that drive home, I confessed all of my sins of pride and arrogance and my unwillingness to really work with people and serious problems that's there. And I hope that you have some kind of an idea of what biblical counseling can do, not just in helping people here, but also in transforming your own life. In fact, routinely, I hear this all the time, that um, in our program here at the Master's Seminary, and as well as at the college, the graduate program that we have, the Master of Arts and Biblical Counseling program, people say, I, I came into these programs in order to learn how to help people and this program actually ended up helping me first. It transformed uh, my life first. And I, that's exactly what I'm hoping for you. I'm hoping that this particular course will be life transforming, not just an academic exercise. Uh, that um, the relevancy, the depth, and the practicality of the Word of God in addressing really difficult issues of the soul will be plainly seen for you. In other words, you can tell I am very excited about training pastoral counselors and biblical counselors. Biblical counseling is exciting. It's life-changing. It revolutionizes your own life and ministry as well as the life of other people. And so as we begin this class, I want to make sure that we're talking about the same thing. In our day and age, there are many definitions of biblical counseling. There shouldn't be, but there are different views of what biblical counseling is. Almost anybody who uses the Bible claims to be a biblical counselor, but that doesn't make you a biblical counselor any more than cults using the Bible make them biblical. What is it that makes up for biblical counseling? Well, let me share with you in this first segment what it's not, and then we're going to talk about what it is. First of all, biblical counseling is not an autonomous ministry. It's not an autonomous ministry. That's really important for you to understand. And in fact, if I were to do a quick overview of this particular course, I would say this. What we want to do in this course is we want to introduce you to what true biblical counseling is. Then at this particular point, we want to help you to understand the Christian life, which touches on almost every counseling situation that you will ever encounter. And then third, we want to talk about the essentials in biblical counseling and actually talk towards the end of this class about its methodology. So those are the three things that are really critical here. So when defining biblical counseling, what, what biblical counseling is not, it is not an autonomous ministry. In other words, we're not talking about training people to hang a shingle out and say, come to me for counseling. That's the world's model, but you do not find a model like that in scripture. Um, it's not an autonomous ministry that somehow is isolated from the local church. When you read and carefully study and exegete the word of God, you begin to realize that all the counseling in the New Testament, and there is an awful lot of counseling in the New Testament. There's more counseling in the New Testament than there is preaching or sermons in the New Testament. That the counseling in the New Testament at this particular um, as, as you as you carefully study it through from beginning to end um, is um, within the context of believers within local churches. You find all the New Testament epistles addressing churches and individuals who are in those churches and their particular problems. Occasionally, there are epistles that address individuals. We can see that in 2nd or 3rd John, but the vast majority is within the context of the local church. 
And usually when it is used to address individuals, it's done with apostolic authority at that particular point. But God has not called us anywhere in the New Testament to learn how to be a counselor and to go outside of the local church and hang up a shingle and have people come to us, usually with a fee or a charge. God has not called us to do those kind of things. Um, because there are, when you begin to talk about that kind of counseling, we're talking about a lot of problems arising. When you hang up a shingle and you want to create a counseling clinic or something that's independent of the local church, there is often a lack of accountability. Uh, there is often doctrinal compromise that occurs there because there is no oversight of biblically qualified elders. And oftentimes there's financial compromise as well because the, uh, the use of resources that should be going to the local church and the advancement of the gospel of Jesus Christ is now funneled off in another area in order to support a clinic and all of its resources. Um, we have never, in, in almost the 35 years that I have been doing pastoral counseling or biblical counseling, I've never charged a penny for anybody who comes to me for counseling. That's any more than I charge people to hear my sermons. Um, that doesn't happen. That, that, that's not the model. That's not the New Testament model of counseling at all. Um, the word of God is freely dispensed. And the emphasis here is upon freely. It is given forth. Um, it is preached and proclaimed, whether you're in a counseling room or whether you're in a pulpit, uh, for free. And then it's up to the church of God then to support that particular pastor if they choose to do it, or associate pastor, if they choose to do it on a full-time basis and to do counseling in, in a similar manner. In some cases, some churches support part-time counselors in that church, and that's fine as well. But that's something that they choose to do, but it's not a for, for fee charge. Um, so it's not an autonomous ministry. Secondly, not only that, but biblical counseling is not an activity re reserved for the experts. There are far too many in our society and culture today who have given counseling sort of this Gnostic flavor. Um, but what we're really advocating here is a biblical model that any believer willing to be like a good Berean can follow. If you want to really counsel, then you have to use the word of God, faithfully interpret it well with good hermeneutical principles, exegete it well, and bring it to bear on people's specific problems. This is where God works. This is where true spirit transformation takes place in people's lives. So we're not talking about a counseling model where people have PhDs in psychology or psychotherapy, and they're the only ones who uh, have the um, ability to be able to counsel the deep problems of the soul. No, 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 not at all. We're talking about uh, people who are well-trained in scripture. They're the ones who are really qualified from God's point of view to really deal with the deep problems of the soul. Unfortunately, there are a lot of Christians, including pastors that have contributed to that kind of thinking. But biblical, being a biblical counselor requires work, it requires effort, it requires dependence upon God. In Colossians 1.29, the Apostle Paul says, there's a balance between dependence upon God and our responsibility to labor. Um, and I like what Spurgeon says. Spurgeon says, um, I labor, uh, in, in referring to that Colossians 1.29 passage, uh, we must work as if it all depends on us and pray as if it all depends upon God. That's what we do in counseling. We work as if it all depends upon us, but we pray knowing really in final reality that it all depends upon God. As a counselor, as a pastor, I cannot change anybody. There's no amount of technique. There's no amount of methodology that will ever change a person. It has to be the Holy Spirit taking the truth of the word of God in that person's life in order to bring about transformation. In fact, there are many times that I have walked out of a counseling situation thinking, man, I did a terrible job in that counseling scenario, and yet God still honored his word and transformed the lives of people. And then there are other times I've walked out and thought to myself, wow, uh, 
those counselees have a great counselor, but then there's no transformation that takes place in their life. All of that is totally and completely left up to the spirit of God and to the spirit's transformation. If you're a Christian, you're equipped to give biblical counsel. Thirdly, I want you to see this, that biblical counseling is not an optional ministry either. It's not an optional ministry. It's not optional like um, having senior saints dinners in your church. That's an optional ministry. It's not an optional ministry like having a radio program for their, your church. Um, it's not one of those things, well, maybe we'll decide this is a dimension of our ministry. No, when we're advocating this particular model, it's a biblical model. It's a part of the very framework and the fabric of the church life. This is what the entire church should be doing as part of its body life dynamic. Uh, they should be counseling one another. And that's what makes the ministry of that particular church incredibly vibrant. And it speaks to people's hearts. And people begin to realize that there is, um, uh, this is a church where real people's problems are actually dealt with. So, in fact, I want you to grab your Bible. Um, if you have an electronic Bible, then get it. Or if you have a paper Bible, then go ahead and get that and go over to Acts chapter 20. We're interested in here in looking at verse 20. Here, the Apostle Paul is saying his farewell for the final time to the Ephesian elders. It's a very emotional passage because he has invested a good deal of his ministry there into their lives, and they have um, their lives have been transformed by and through his ministry, both in his preaching as well as his counseling. Look at verse 20, Acts 20 and verse 20. He says, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house. Now, you understand that balance there, and that's a critical balance. Um, in other words, Paul defines his ministry for these Ephesian elders as a ministry that was a public ministry of the word of God. That's where they... Um, that's where he preached to people publicly. But he also talks about the fact um, that he also did it from house to house. That's the private ministry of the word of God. And that's the ministry of counseling. Counseling is a targeted form of discipleship. It is uh, focused in on specific people's needs. Um, and Paul had that balance. Uh, we have to get back to that Acts 2020 vision of the ministry. In other words, there has to be a public preaching of the word of God, which is vital and necessary for the life of that church, but a personal counseling of the word of God that was, is just as vital, just as necessary for that church as well. Then, if you will, skip down then to verse 31. I, I wish we had more time that we could spend in this passage, but he says, therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years, I did not cease night and day to admonish each one with tears. And the word admonish is the word nuthatao. Paul basically says, I didn't cease to um, counsel you, warn you, admonish you. And notice he says, everyone. In other words, this wasn't just to groups within the church or to the church at large, he, he ministered the word of God, each one of them. Verse 31 is very clear. And he did it with tears. He wasn't some kind of detached psychotherapist, white coat clinical approach to counseling. It, he, he was vitally involved in their problems to the point that their problems brought him to the place of tears. When's the last time you were vitally involved with somebody's problems who was not a member of your family and their problems so moved you that it brought you to tears? That's what biblical counseling is all about. That's what we do. We're so involved with individual people in working with their problems. It brought the apostle Paul to tears. And Paul says in this passage, you study it carefully. He says, I want you to emulate as elders, this kind of ministry. This is part of the leadership of the church as Ephesian elders. I want you to follow my example and then go over to Romans chapter 15. Um, Romans chapter 15 is another critical passage here in verse 14, uh, as Paul draws uh, this great particular um, book to a close, he says, uh, 
now he's no longer talking to the leadership of the church. Uh, in verse 14, he says, I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge and able to instruct one another. That word instruct is our word, word nuthetao. Nuthetao, it means to um, admonish, to, to teach, to warn, to instruct one another. Uh, and he's not talking to leadership now. He's talking to a whole church at Rome. Um, and he says they're full of goodness. The, he's not talking about their internal goodness. It means that they're full of goodness in relationship to their intentions to one another. Um, they have good intentions for one another. And they're able to instruct one another. And that word nuthetao is basically takes a Greek noun, nous, which means mind, and tithemi, which is a verb that means to place or to put. So you put it together, it means to place or to put um, truth into the mind. That's what counseling is, to place or to put truth into the mind, to nuthetao another person, um, to place truth there. Now, Sometimes you're going to be dealing with people who are sinners. Uh, that's one type of counseling who need to vitally change their ways. And sometimes you're going to be dealing in counseling with people who are sinned against. These are people who have been hurt as a result of the behaviors and deeds of others. Whatever the case may be, we bring the word of God to bear. Both the word of God cuts in some cases those who need to change, and it heals those who need healing. Uh, the ministry of Nuthetao is about that. Every believer is responsible then to encourage and strengthen other believers with God's word and is divinely equipped to do so. Let's go over to Colossians. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 28. Um, <clears throat> here we mentioned verse 29 already. Um, but verse 28 says, um, we proclaim him warning everyone, teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. Now, the word warning is our word nuthetao again. Um, and you'll notice the context here is not talking actually about preaching. The context here is about counseling. Because the emphasis here in verse 28 is upon everyone. Three times he mentions everyone. Um, Paul was admonishing and teaching every man to counter the false teaching about Christ and the legalism that seemed to be a part of the Colossae church. Paul's goal in the whole manner was to present every man complete in Christ. His purpose was to make every man complete, mature, and to help them be like Christ. Um, so what do you do when a member of your congregation is caught in adultery or is subject to fits of anger? Or maybe they're extremely overwhelmed with fear or what the world sometimes even refers to as panic attacks. Or they're overly anxious or they're extremely depressed or they manifest manic or bipolar behavior. What do you do? Where do you turn for help? How do you help them? Uh, will you take your instruction from the world in dealing with those problems? Are, or are you going to take your instruction from the infallible word of God? That's the question. Number four, this is really interesting. Biblical counseling is not an entity separate from discipleship. You can see this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 through 21, um, uh, where the apostle Paul talks about leading uh, the Corinthian believers to Christ and then leading them to Christ-likeness. If we had more time, we would spend more time in this, but you can study this on your own. In verse 14, he loved them. He admonished them as well. Verse 15, he set an example for them. He taught them in verse 17. He reproduced them as well. He discipled them when necessary in verses 18 through 21. So, Biblical counseling is not an entity separate from discipleship at all. It's very much, it's a targeted form of discipleship. And then number five, biblical counseling is not an activity that is insensitive or uncaring. No, in order to do so, you must be humble. You must be gentle. Biblical counseling is to be done in a caring way as a caring parent. Paul's example in 1 Corinthians 4.15 is great. Um, in other words, we're not throwing Bible verses at people haphazardly. Take two verses and call me in the morning. That kind of philosophy. We're not doing that. 
Uh, we're not saying be warm and be filled as James warns us not to do in James 2. You need to care about people. That's what a pastor's heart is. Uh, you care about the people that you're ministering to. You need to pray for them as our wonderful counselor, Jesus Christ. He is the ultimate shepherd. We're under shepherds. We need to pray for them and we need to counsel them in love. Well, in our next segment, we want to talk about what biblical counseling is.